East of Neston in Northamptonshire. What triumphs and disasters this house can bear witness to. Debts, jewels, family estrangements, fortunes lost, sometimes at the turn of a card, and fortunes won. It's a wonderful design, a building with tremendous power and presence, an architectural masterpiece. But it's not only a house of beauty, it's also a house of secrets. Precisely who designed it and when has been one of the greatest mysteries of British architecture. Eastern Neston is also a house full of history. It's a testament in stone to more than three centuries of his owner's wealth, power and privilege. The ordinary man and woman would have seen the world of the Firmers as I would see Bill Gates, something so far away. It's, it's a completely different universe. The Firmer family kept Eastern Neston going thanks to two desperate measures, mortgage and marriage. This is the consumer society in the 18th century, and so they increasingly get into debt. And so one of the ways, of course, to pay that off, a strategy, indeed, is to marry. For ten generations, this family didn't dirt his hands with business, up until the 1970s, when it went into the motor trade. Here was a turn up for the books, if not for the family fortunes. After all, it's not every country house that gets to play host to a Formula One racing team. The latest chapter in Eastern Neston's history shows that it's lost none of its power to please. In 2005, it became the European headquarters of a global fashion brand. Its new owner isn't an aristocrat, but a wealthy Los Angeles-based, Russian-born fashion designer with a liking for traditional English country pursuits. It was really love at first sight. It was the most beautiful house uh, that I had ever seen. I, I, I had to have it right there and then. Easton Neston is one of the most beautiful examples of a short-lived but important architectural movement, English Baroque. It only lasted from the 1660s to the 1730s. For me, it's one of the richest and most glorious styles of our native architecture. Baroque is based on ancient classical models, but it's playful, willful and inventive. It began in Italy, here in England, Baroque was more reserved, less sinuous and feminine, a little bit more masculine in style, but still sumptuous. The interior is every bit as imposing as the exterior, and again, is a masterpiece of the Baroque style. Originally, this wall wasn't here, it was just a pair of columns. And there was a reason for this. When the house was built, we would have stepped through the front door and immediately encountered Eastern Neston's first splendor. This was one of the most famous and spatially surprising and exciting rooms in early 18th century Britain. It's the hall and originally it was double height was twice as high as it is now. The ceiling was inserted in the late 19th century. And here we can see what the hall looked like when first built. Can you imagine the extraordinary impact this double height room would have had? It was one of the greatest glories of the English Baroque. One thing that characterizes Baroque is that each new space you encounter is designed to take you by surprise. The staircase is the architectural high point, the focus of the interior, indeed, of the house. 
It's all to do, of course, with space, light, drama. This was one of the most admired staircases in the whole of Europe, and with good reason. The staircase is not just visually beautiful, it's also something of an engineering marvel. There are these rebates on the underside of each tread. They lock the treads together and they ensure that the weight of the staircase is transferred in a reliable and regular manner from tread to tread, from top to bottom. The whole staircase does seem to deny common sense. It really does float. Also, what I love is the fact that most people using this staircase, bounding up and down it, have no idea what keeps it standing. And the great staircase has another trick up its sleeve. As you turn the corner and walk up the second flight of stairs, the experience is different again. Looking back towards the mighty window, the quality of the space it's very different. It becomes a world now of light and shade. And so to the next part of the tour, and is another cleverly worked transition. From antique gloom to light, this gallery is again a glorious spatial surprise. It stretches the full depth the house and um, at each end are huge windows. These windows offer uh, sensational views out. One can see here that in fact this gallery sits astride an axis through the house but also extended into the landscape in this direction and that direction as far as the eye can see. So although this gallery is, in a sense, the end of the architectural promenade through the house. It's also a connection to the larger world. And, of course, the human figures in this landscape would have been peering back, in shock and awe. This family had arrived, but where had it started from? The story of Eastern Neston starts here. It was a large Tudor house, 150 yards south of the existing house, which means the mansion was roughly where I'm walking now. And if you think that Eastern Neston sounds like a village, well, it was. But the village was removed in 1499. All that marks its existence is the medieval parish church. As for the parishioners themselves, well, it seemed they were simply thrown off the estate. They were in the way. And here in the church are the tombs of the family, which was to own the estate of Eastern Neston from the 1530s until 2005. The firm of family had scrabbled its way up through the Tudor ranks to become important merchants, lawyers and politicians. Under the Stuarts came formal recognition of their burgeoning status. This temple or, or banqueting house is dated 1641. Now, it could mark the beginnings of a, a great ambition because in 1641, the same date as it was built, William Fermer was made a baronet. As so, William, he may have hankered after a grand new house in keeping with his brand new status. Could this little garden building indeed be the beginning of a great building campaign to create a new classical country house in this style just about here? If this was the case, then the timing was somewhat unfortunate because only a year later, the English Civil War started. Building an imposing country house suddenly didn't seem such a pressing priority. But in 1660, 
With the restoration of Charles II, the king's loyal supporters could dust off their checkbooks and start to spend. Here's the man who finally built the new house, the second Sir William Firmer. He was an MP, but he wasn't like his ancestors in trade. The Firmers had left the cutthroat world of the Tudors behind and reached sunnier pastures. Firmers' wealth came not from business, but from a different source altogether, marriage. Marrying money was a, a lot quicker and presumably easier than actually earning it. In 1671, Sir William Firmer's first wife proved this because she bought him a dowry, a wedding gift, of £7,000. She soon died, but ten years later, he married a second time, and that wife bought him a dowry of £9,000. That's inflation for you. And now, with the money flooding in, the time had come to spend it. Firmer took a momentous decision. He resolved to build a grand new house to reflect the family's rising fortunes. For this, an architect would come in handy, and luckily for Firmer, he was related to one by marriage, Sir Christopher Wren. There could hardly have been a more prestigious name to call on. Wren was a wonder of the age, Britain's greatest living architect, responsible for designing St Paul's Cathedral and over 50 churches after London's Great Fire of 1666. He was one of Britain's first superstar architects. We know for certain that Wren was approached by Firma, but how much involvement did he actually have in the design of Eastern Neston? This seemingly simple question has turned into one of the longest running controversies in British architectural history, but as one we're hoping to solve. The first staging post on the Eastern Neston Trail is here at Oxford. Wren's career as an architect began at the university. He was a fellow here at All Souls, and a professor, not of architecture, but of astronomy. This sundial is his work. Many of Wren's papers are still kept here at All Souls, including one that's of particular interest to us. Here at All Souls is a design that is said to be the first, or certainly very early, design for Easter Neston by Sir Christopher Wren. What's intriguing is that the existing house is nine windows wide. This is indeed nine windows wide. So in scale similar, in broad composition similar, main block with wings, but much, much more modest. Much more modest than the existing building. This seems very clearly to be a design for Easter Neston. But how come the existing house was not built to Wren's design? At a certain point, and frustratingly, we don't know exactly when it was, Wren handed over the design of Eastern Neston to his talented protégé, Nicholas Hawksmoor. Hawksmoor was born around 1662. His thought were poor farming family in Nottinghamshire. He came to work for Wren aged 18 and became his clerk, pupil and eventually collaborator. And what a career Hawksmoor had. Up to his death in 1736, he was one of the greatest exponents of the English Baroque style. He also built in a different manner at All Souls. But his most famous work are the six astonishing churches he designed in London after 1712, such as Christ Church Spitalfields. These are the mature masterpieces of the English Baroque, the culmination of a journey into the sublime 
that began for Hawksmoor at Easton Neston. But how did the young Hawksmoor come to be involved in Easton Neston at all? And how did we get from this rather modest design to this? Clues as to how the design of Easton Neston changed so radically are to be found here, the North Wing. Originally, it was a matching wing opposite that contained the stables. That was demolished just over 200 years ago, leaving only its twin still standing. It's thought to date from the 1680s, and by tradition has been called the Wren Wing, because it's vaguely in the style of Wren. Few people now believe this is by Wren. It is not like his designs that survive in All Souls College, and Hawksmoor called the wing good for nothing, something he would not have said if it had been by Wren, his revered master. So, who did design it? Well, we have absolutely no idea. What we do know is when the wing was built. That's because Robert Howard, a dendrochronologist, has used a tree ring dating technique to show that the wing was roofed between 1683 and 1686. Next, he's going to be dating the roof of the main house. The wing was all but destroyed by fire in 2002. It's been restored by the architect Ptolemy Dean, who also commissioned the tree ring dating. After stripping away decades of plywood, paint and plaster, Ptolemy has uncovered some intriguing secrets that the building's been keeping to itself. Looking at the difference between two sets of roof timbers, it seems that after the wing was built, six feet were chopped off one end of it. Then look what happens here. The end A bay here is cut short, cut off, and, you, shot. Shot. and you can imagine it's because they look out there and they say, goodness me, we're not going to have enough room for that house. Here's the proof. The windows of the roof aren't arranged symmetrically. If you look behind you at that elevation there, you'll That's see fine. one, two, three windows. Yeah. You see it's moved in? I do. Do I you do. see that? I do, I do. More space on the exactly. right than left. So, right from the start, there were concerns that not enough room had been left for the main house. And when he came to restore the basement, Ptolemy found that it too had been altered at some point after it had first been built. Here is one of those basement piers. Yeah. Just, you know, standard stuff here, and it all carries on vaulting here. And then look, where are we on the plan? We are under the staircase. great staircase. And look at this, suddenly we've got more of this massive Hawksmoor masonry, this banding abutting up to the existing yes. stone piers. Later, and later, later. Later, 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 later. And this incredible depth. And it's not just here, but it's there. It's on the there, other side. And here. And we've deliberately left this area unpainted so that you can see clearly Hawksmoor coming into this existing basement saying, this, uh, this staircase is not going to be supported on the existing flimsy stone vaulting. We need some proper stone masonry here to make the grand staircase for this grand house I'm making above. So, the vault in the basement corridor was strengthened by the addition of massive stone arches to help support the great staircase. And the vaults in the kitchen were also strengthened to support the weight of a redesigned double-height hall. It seems that neither of these heavy stone structures was in prospect when the building of the basement started. So why did the house get grander in conception? We need to look at the family history. In 1687, Sir William Fermor's second wife died. Perhaps that's why work on the house stopped. But five years later, he married again and hit the jackpot. He married the daughter of the Duke of Leeds, one of the most important grandees in the country. 
He was the main Tory sponsor of William and Mary, who became king and queen after the Glorious Revolution of 1688. The Duke wasted no time in pulling strings for his son-in-law. Within six weeks of his marriage, Sir William Firmer joined the peerage. He became Lord Leominster, or Lempster. The Glorious Revolution had ushered in a golden age for the aristocracy. To celebrate their increasing wealth and power, a spate of country house building now began. Eastern Neston included. The great house was the great statement of a landed family. And uh, of course, the land was the basis of power, of political power, not just of economic power, but political power. And it was through land that you influenced the sort of political world around you. And uh, the development of that uh, estate is, is an investment in the future of your family and your descendants being part of the ruling class. At the centre of this power network was marriage. With uh, William Firmall, he has three marriages and he seems to move upwards. He mm. seems to be doing the... the Social the, sense. Yes, yeah, yeah. this is about looking for uh, marrying into a prestigious lineage. Yeah. So clearly money will come with that, yeah. but the social status is, yeah. is of some significance there. Looking for power, family uh, yes, power. Yes, because yeah. they're marrying not just into yeah. uh, an important lineage, the patronage networks yeah. Yeah. come with that, and that's a way yeah. to, to, to gain yeah. all of those sorts yeah. of political yeah. influence and yeah. so on. Power, patronage and political influence, the voters were often in their pockets, were part and parcel of the aristocrats' trappings. But they were also at pains to show that they were people of culture and learning. The country house had also to advertise its owner's taste. In 1691, with his third marriage in prospect, Sir William bought a collection of important statues. They were known as the Arundel Marbles, after Lord Arundel, who collected them in the early 17th century. It's the first ever British collection of statues from ancient Greece and Rome. The hall and staircase weren't just the showpieces of the house, they're also conceived as the setting for the Arundel Marbles. Sir William Firmer was intent on becoming the Charles Such of his day, the possessor of Britain's finest private art collection. The staircase is in many ways designed around the Arundel marbles, which occupied these various niches each side of the staircase hall. Here's a statue, modern edition. Does the job rather, rather beautifully, actually, but here would have been one of the, the great inspirational Arundel marbles. And on the wall, between the niches where the marble sat, is a series of rather stupendous wall paintings executed by James Thornhill just after the house was completed. Thornhill was one of the leading artists of his day. He also painted the interior of the Dome of St Paul's. The whole thing works as a, an ascending art gallery. And that's the point, in a way, this is like a museum, in a way it's the pioneers of the public museum, because in the 18th century, groups of people came here, two or three groups a week, to admire the Arundel marbles, to be inspired by them, but also to enjoy Thornhill's paintings. These parts of the house, that were meant to impress important visitors, took up a huge amount of space. And remember, space was in short supply, because the wings had already been built. So how did Hawksmoor fit in the less spectacular rooms that are essential for the running of the house? Luckily, he left a guide to show us just how ingenious he'd been. Up until 2005, it was at the house. Now it's at the study center of the Royal Institute of British Architects in the Victoria and Albert Museum. Well, the model of Eastern Neston, one of the most important, fascinating and enigmatic objects in British architectural history. Dates from the very late 17th century and simply models from that period really do not survive. 
also course, it's by one of Britain's greatest architects. What a fantastic opportunity to see in the making one of um, Britain's greatest country houses. Here we can see how the hall once rose the full height of the building. But Hawkshall had to work hard to make room for it. So these little bedrooms and service areas, including these little service staircases here, really packing the spaces together in a very, very, very ingenious manner because so much of the volume of the house has gone for the great state rooms, the double height hall, the great staircase. Here's the clever bit. The ranch is two stories set above the basement, as the garden elevation implies. But four stories at the south end of the house and five at the north end. Cunningly hidden away are mezzanine floors, into which Hawksmoor crams staircases for servants and bedrooms for less important guests. On the north elevation, this is made plain. And here we can see that there was one major difference between this model and what was actually built. At this stage in the design, there are two stories of columns. But evidently, this didn't satisfy the customer's insatiable demand for ostentation. He wanted more swank. And he got it. Hawksworth made the building grander and more imposing still, as travellers on what was the main road to Northampton might just have noticed. This is the view the public would have had of the house. This is why its design got increasingly grand. And here was the 18th century equivalent of the heated swimming pool, palm trees and helipad on the roof. These columns, which rise the full height of the house, are in a style made famous by Michelangelo. They are called the giant order and they constitute a giant statement. Now, the giant order carries many messages and for Hawksmoor, would have the stamp of Roman authority. The client would have loved that association. Gave him also, of course, the dignity and authority of a Roman senator. The same swaggering spirit is also present in the Roman design of the capitals. But there's a rather curious and charming variation on antique prototype. Hawksmoor introduced the head of a lion. There it is at the centre, at the top of the composite capital, a lion's head. But why a lion's head? Well, because the client had recently been made Lord Lempster, or Lord Leo Minster. Leo for lion. And to top it all, hora e sempre, now and always, there's confidence for you. Contemporaries raved about the building. One wrote that, in the opinion of good judges, no seat in Europe exceeds it. A resounding triumph for Nicholas Hawksmoor then, alas, is not so simple. Forty years ago, an eminent architectural historian set the cat amongst the pigeons. He suggested that the house was built between 1685 and 1695 in brick, partly to designs by Nicholas Hawksmoor and partly to designs by Hawksmoor's old master, Sir Christopher Wren. Five years later, the argument goes, Hawksmoor covered the brick house in stone and added the giant order. This theory, if true, would reduce Hawksmoor's role in the creation of the house and deny him the full credit for his first major independent commission. And now the time has come to test his troublesome theory against the insights offered by modern science. Up in the attics, the tree ring dating specialist Robert Howard has taken a dozen or so samples from the original roof timbers. Here, we hope, is the answer once and for all. You can see the, the growth rings of this uh, particular tree on this sample here, which I've sanded up and polished just to, to yeah. show them, etc. And you can see that there are variations in width 
over the lifetime of this tree caused by the, okay. the weather. And it's rather like a supermarket barcode. So answer. you feel confident these samples can give a, a, a really precise Absolutely, accuracy. I feel very confident. The prognosis for a res result um, is very good indeed. Whatever he did or didn't design, Hawkes will finish the main fabric of the house in 1702. And for nearly four decades, the Thurma family lived high on the hog. In 1721, aged just 24, the son of the builder of the house became an earl, Earl Pomfret. To celebrate, he decided to spruce up his collection of marbles. As is the habit of ancient statues, many torsos were missing limbs. The Earl decided to make good that deficit. He hired an Italian sculptor named Giovanni Guelfi to add new heads and limbs. This book, published in the 1760s, recalls the appearance of the Arundel marbles, the various statues, after the first Earl had had his way with them. What fun they must have had deciding what would go where. There is here, for example, Paris. Head, legs, parts of body added. This was on the staircase and throughout the 18th century. This would have been regarded as an exemplary, inspirational piece of ancient art until taste changed. They were, for years, the family's pride and joy. And the first Lord Leominster specified in his will that they were to stay in the house forever. But they're not here now. What happened? The answer is that cracks were beginning to appear in the firmer facade. The magnificent image shown to the public was increasingly a lie. Behind the scenes, in private, the Earl and Countess were going broke. Eastern Neston provided status. It burnt money. By the late 1730s, the ink was so red they had to relocate to Italy, where the living was cheaper, and close Eastern Neston down for three years. And with the next generation, things were to get even worse. The Firma family is not very well known, but there's a wonderful mosaic of information lurking in various archives throughout the land. And if this information is brought together, a rather fascinating picture emerges. In letters and court reports, we meet the black sheep of the Firma family, the son of the first Earl. He was going broke even quicker than his parents. In letter after letter, his father pleased with him to economize and not gamble. Despite all the advice from his father, the son, George Firmer, did not reform. He was very much um, a rake, indeed an extreme example of a Georgian rake. He was um, involved, as we know, in at least four duels. And in one, in 1752, he actually killed his opponent, a fellow guards officer. They were fighting with swords and he ran the chap through. Now this was potentially a case of murder. He was um, indeed sent to trial at the Old Bailey and Alton was found guilty of manslaughter, which for him was, of course, very fortunate. Otherwise, he could have been executed. On another occasion, we're told he lost £12,000 at a single sitting at cards. That's 500 times what a labourer earned in a year. This day could hardly have gone to a less safe pair of hands, but the aristocracy were no fools. Over the years, they constructed a built-in safety net to protect country houses, contents, estates, wealth and status from improvident eldest sons. They did it by various legal methods that prevented the eldest son selling off the house or estate. The land had to stay in the family. 
unable to trust his wayward son to provide dowries for his unmarried sisters, the Earl took drastic action. He couldn't prevent his eldest son inheriting the house, but he could stop him getting his hands on the contents. The Earl duly changed his will and left his movable possessions to his daughters. And so when the first Earl died in 1753, there was a huge sale in which virtually everything, apart from the family portraits, was sold off. When I say everything, I mean everything. This is a copy of the catalogue for the um, 1753 sale, it says here, catalogue, of some household furniture, brewing vessels, garden rollers, cucumber frames, glasses, etc., of the Right Honourable, the Earl of Pomfret, deceased. Great variety of bedsteads, curtains, but also there are things one regard as fittings, lead cisterns, uh, kitchen furniture. I could sell the kitchen sink. I imagine when these things were sold, the house was pretty well uninhabitable. A large range, two pot hooks, and a lead curb around the sink. It really is the kitchen sink. These people are desperate for the last penny. And the Arundel marbles, the family's pride and joy, were donated to Oxford, out of the clutches of the second Earl, as it now become. Imagine you're the second Earl in 1754, and your house, the symbol of your aristocratic status, is echoingly empty, apart from family portraits looking accusingly down from the walls. And all of this is your fault, a result of your spendthrift habits. Would you hang your head in shame? I should hope so. Did the second Earl? Probably not. What he did was look around for a solution. And he needed one. He'd inherited a mortgage of £6,000. Within 10 years, it stood at £30,000. That's more than seven times his state's annual rental income. But then, as bankruptcy beckoned, with one bound, our hero was free, or at least married. What we know of Anna Maria is that she was somewhat on the stout side and very rich. One contemporary observer said she was like a richly laden treasure ship. Another, that her tonnage was equal to her poundage, but whatever her appearance, she brought much needed money into the family. There are no known portraits of the second Earl, but here in the Paris church, well away from the altar, we can make his acquaintance. Here he is, the reckless Georgian rake. With him is his wife. Anna Maria, an interesting monument, this. He has his head in his hands, I suppose, worrying about the afterlife, though it does rather look as if he's worrying about his money troubles. And she was described in life as looking like a well-laden treasure ship. Here, of course, looking very svelte indeed, lovely. What happened to her money, we're not quite sure, but what we do know is the Earl did not use it to pay off the mortgage on Eastern Neston. The honour of trying to pay that off went to the son of George and Anna Maria, the third Earl. His tomb's also to be found in the parish church. Here he is sitting looking very composed. It says here, George, third Earl of Pomfret, a dutiful son, a most kind brother a father to all his family, a beneficent landlord, a beloved master, a sincere Christian, but it does not say, of course, he was a good and loving husband. And that's the way it is, so often with monuments, it's um, what's not said that says everything. The third Earl certainly was a husband. Indeed, thanks to his mortgage, he took up the family business with a considerable enthusiasm and, like his father, snapped up an heiress. Mary Trollope Brown was the daughter 
of a rich landowner, rather stiffly described as an opulent wine merchant. No pictures of her exist. All we know about her is that she was 25 and absolutely loaded, to the tune of nearly 120,000 pounds. A master craftsman might earn 200 pounds a year. The only problem for the Earl was that in aristocratic marriages, the wife's money was usually protected by a marriage settlement, the prenuptial agreement of its day. Mary agreed to cough up £30,000 to pay off the mortgage. The other £90,000 she would keep. So far, so good. But then, as are often in the history of a marriage, a mother-in-law throws a spanner into the works. In this case, by her unexpected death. Because the mother-in-law dies, yes. her money goes straight to him. Yes because she doesn't make a will. Now, if she'd made oh, a will where she set that yeah. money aside for her daughter's separate use, they'd have, you know, the daughter would yeah. have been safe. But because this money goes straight to the husband, that's one of the complaints that the uh, wife makes, yeah. which is that once he got his hands on her money, he it's treated her, her badly, yeah. yes. Yeah. With a marriage in meltdown, the Earl and Countess separate, and soon lawyers are called in to establish who's at fault. The Earl accuses Mary of physical violence and being scruffy. She accuses him of mental cruelty and adultery. They do separate, but the Earl still wants his £30,000. Mary tells him he can whistle for it, and then finally, 25 years after the marriage, the Court of Chancery decides in the Earl's favour. For the first time in 65 years, the family is back in the black. How did all this affect Easton Neston? The real change caused by Mary's money wasn't seen in the house, but in the grounds, the acreage of which was increased. When the third Earl came into funds in the early 1820s, he commissioned this splendid gate and neoclassical screen. At the same time, he moved some public roads further away from the main house. The object, of course, was to increase the splendor and isolation of the setting of Eastern Neston. But despite the family motto, now and always, in 1867, the male firm line died out, and through marriage, Easton Nesson passed to a new family, the Heskeths, who duly became firmer Heskeths. Thanks to marriage to two terrifyingly rich American heiresses, the old firmer formula, the Heskeths managed to keep the house afloat, and then some. This was the new money that paid for the hall to be altered in the 1890s. Meanwhile, daily life in the house continued, almost as if in a time capsule. Trish York began to work as a lady's maid here in 1975 for Lady Hesketh. At that point, Easton Neston was still very much in upstairs, downstairs mode. As a, a young lady's maid, it was my duty to clean these stairs and you touch the them stairs. absolutely. Let's Every bit of the wrought iron, yes. And here, let's face And yes. here, oh, the wrought iron, absolutely. that's the thing, isn't it? And Lady Hesketh used to come along and, and she'd inspect every single one, and, and if it wasn't right, she'd come and tell us, or she'd do it herself. Beautiful. In, in the 70s, um, what was life like? Was, was it, really, as one might imagine, a, a great Victorian country house to be. Yes, it was. Uh, I, everybody had their job to do, um, and the butler would preside over us all. He followed us around and made sure that everything was done, and when we said that a room had been done, or such, you know, the cushions had been plumped, plumped up when yeah. people had gone to dinner, and he would come in and check that. <laughs> 
But the House was soon to enter a somewhat more informal stage. In 1973, the President, Lord Hesketh, set up a Formula One racing team. Here was a chapter every bit as colourful as anything Eastern Neston had yet seen. When Lord Hesketh was more in control of the house, your role presumably changed to a degree. It changed the different calibre caliber of people that were coming along. You know, it wasn't, it wasn't gentry that were coming along or aristocrats as much. They were coming along, but it was generally more everyday people. Did they know how to behave, though, the, 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 the no, guests? No, not at I mean, all. Did they, did they no. Probably, no, that's fascinating. That's, yeah. that's, that's how the world had changed. Yeah. The guests didn't know how to behave. No, absolutely not. Yeah. No. Interesting, isn't and it? And a lot of them were models and things that, that you know, that, that had, had never been to a big house before and just suddenly thought, oh, I've got people on hand to get me a cup of tea and, you know, do this, that and do and constantly ringing the bell because they wanted you to come and get them some ice or whatever and you'd say, well, the ice is in the cupboard just there. <laughs> The Hesketh racing team enjoyed great early success. In 1974, James Hunt won at Silverstone. In 1975, Team Hesketh won a Grand Prix, the last privately owned team ever to do so. Mick Broom came to work here at Eastern Neston as an engineer. Can you tell me a bit more about you know, the, the, the Formula One days here? Uh, I think a lot of the things that will be remembered was obviously the fact that he was a privateer, he didn't have any sort of backing, uh, but they also approached the racing a lot, lo a lot more different. Yeah. Uh, they were professional, they worked hard in the, in the sort of producing the, the car from next to nothing, but they also played hard. And, uh, you know, there's lots and lots of stories around of them going to Monaco with one car and three yachts, whereas <laughs> most people went with one yacht <laughs> and three cars, you know. <laughs> When the racing team folded, that wasn't the end of motorsports here at Eastern Neston. In a market full of inexpensive Japanese imports, Lord Hesketh picked up the gauntlet and tried to revive the ailing British luxury bike industry. I built this personally. This, this, this actual this this, one? This bike, yes. Oh. It, was, uh, it was a labour of love more than anything else in those days because we, uh, we were starting from almost raw aluminium. It was a job which was inspired by the surroundings. It was inspired by working from the Lord. It's not the sort of thing that you normally get when you're working on motorbikes in back sheds. Interesting, inspired by the, by the building. I mean, did, 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 the, did the beauty of Hawksworth's house and somehow inspire the design? Yes, basically, because, you know, it, it, it all came into the atmosphere. The atmosphere was definitely different from a, a normal commercial exercise. But, I mean, it must have been, gosh, expensive, though. It was expensive because it was a low volume one and it was destined not really to work because, uh, and this is one of the other advantages of the atmosphere and the fact that yeah. it was a lord involved, because if you looked at it as a solid businessman in the 80s when the yeah. bike industry was in decline and all the rest yeah. of it and it was a very expensive bike uh, coming in at the wrong time, you wouldn't do it. Uh, and that, that, that in a way, like that quirkiness, you know, gave us the bike. <laughs> One thing that's remained constant in Eastern Neston throughout its history is the sheer cost of keeping it going. And in 2005, a long chapter in that history came to an end. The house's contents went under the hammer. The sale raised over eight million pounds, the second greatest haul from a country house content sale in British auction history. It was masterminded by James Miller of Sotheby's. Uh, can you tell me, I mean, how Im important was the collection? Well, it was collections, because it was a collection which had grown and diminished in the middle of the 18th century and then grown again and then put on colossal weight at the end of the 19th and early 20th century. And there'd been a succession of members of either the Fermers or the Heskis who had both a liking for works of art, a good eye, and the wherewithal to express it. So it's layer upon layer, accre accretions of taste. And of course, to me, I find that almost more exciting yeah. than having a complete picture. I like a jigsaw puzzle where you put things together. But it was, obviously was, was an important collection in, in so far as reflect the history of this house 
and the history of the family. Well, it's important because you've got, first of all, you've got a house which was built for a collection, wasn't it, haven't you, effectively? Yep. Yeah, the yeah, Arundel, yeah. but I think this house was always meant for display, so you tended not to be able to get away with what you and I might call charming but domestic furniture. Yeah. It's got to earn its keep here. You can't just put in any old bit of mahogany. If you were a, a bad object, you sort of had to go away. <laughs> <laughs> The sale of 2005 had an almost uncanny resemblance to the sale of 1753, when the house was stripped virtually bare. Here again, along with great paintings and grand furniture, there are many far humbler day-to-day -day objects up for sale. For example, a child's croquet set, including five balls, four mallets and six hoops, 40 quid. And here, a Victorian iron garden roller with loop and heart pierced end. Indeed, heartbreaking, 80 quid. Everything had to go, virtually everything did go. Not long after the auction, the house itself was sold. In a good year, Lord Hesketh said, the estate lost half a million pounds. In a bad year, three times that amount. Unlike his ancestor, the second Earl back in 1753, Lord Hesketh could sell the family seat, and he did. The whole estate was put on sale for 50 million pounds, but there were no takers. So the land, that was in theory meant to support the house, was broken up into smaller pieces. 600 prime acres, plus the house itself, was snapped up by the Los Angeles-based Russian-born fashion magnate, Leon Max. Price, 15 million pounds. I had this romantic idea that I should live in the country, in England, in some beautiful old uh, white elephant of a house where I could set up a design studio. And uh, I looked at a few houses. This one was not quite in the price range. I think this was a little too expensive. But uh, at some point, we, we, we made a deal with the Hesketh, and, and, uh, and here we are. So did he leave you um, any, any welcoming gifts, Lord Hesketh? <laughs> you... Yes, there was, a, there was a bottle of vodka with a note, sort of welcome and... <laughs> Good luck. <laughs> Good luck. <laughs> Having moved into a virtually empty house, Leon Max began the job of decorating it in the style of the 18th century. Feels very much a traditional English country house interior. Wonderful paintings, all acquired by you. Yes, it was interesting. It sort of became a hobby for me. Well, I run the dot com, so I have a lot of very clever boys on my staff, and, and they've done a, a model. So we could, uh, anything that came up at auction that I thought was the appropriate piece would be scaled and placed in that model. And so it was all done online, everything was bought online, and uh, hence everything fits rather well. So, from pleasure to business. Yeah, where is it? Very lovely. Yeah, as you can see, it's our uh, uh, advertising shot here. Here, in the restored wing, is Max Studios' European headquarters. Oh, good lord, this is a. <laughs> it, does seem a it does seem a long way from Hawksmoor here, yeah, doesn't it? <laughs> Eastern Neston was built to lend glamour and status to its aristocratic owners, and then did so to a motor sports team. Now it's being used as a backdrop for the most glamorous business of all, fashion. And the Hawkswood design continues to inspire. I, I truly believe that this is one of, if not the most beautiful design studio in the world. I think uh, it's impossible to make anything ugly in, 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 in this setting. And, and we're in the business of putting beautiful things into the world. And so here we are. A 
owners come and go, the house lives on. Eastern Neston has entered a new, if unexpected, chapter. It's one of the greatest buildings in Britain, and certainly one of my favourite country houses. And so it's time, finally, to solve the mystery of who designed it and when. Was it begun in the 1680s, to be designed by Sir Christopher Wren? Or was it Hawksmoor's work alone, built nearer to 1702? Let's get the verdict of the tree ring Hi. dating. Hi. Well, good to see you. Let, let, let's, let's hear your results. Well, I'm not quite sure what date you were really expecting, but I, I can reveal that uh, having taken several samples from the timbers... In the roof. In the roof, of yes. The house, yeah. Of the main house, yes. They were all felled between the spring of 1700 and the spring of 1701. <laughs> well, that's no, completely spot on. Well, I really... I really well, I, I, it's yeah. just what one would expect. So the, Great. This is now well, you know, solved, or the, put, put to bed this speculation. So, so don't believe you've answered one of the great questions great. of English well, answer. Such frustration, actually, that whole question. Good. Well, I'm pleased yeah, yeah, because that... Because actually now Hawksmoor yeah, yeah. reigns supreme in the attics. <laughs> Hawksmoor came back here in 1731, nearly 30 years after the exterior of the house had been completed. At that point, he was ill and his architecture had fallen from favour. But he at least was still pleased with what he saw. He wrote at the time, you can hardly avoid loving your own children. The stately homes of England, how beautiful they stand. To prove the upper classes have still the upper hand. Though the fact that they have to be rebuilt and frequently mortgaged to the hilt is inclined to take the guilt. Off the gingerbread and certainly damps the fun of the eldest son. But still we won't be beaten, we'll scrimp and screw and save. The playing fields of Eton have made us frightfully brave. And though if the Van Dykes have to go and we pawn the Beckstein brand, we'll stand by the stately homes of England.